And we're also going to show my screen. Okay, and so let us begin from the beginning. What well, this was my Romans, not Genesis. Yeah. You know, Genesis is everywhere. So, oh, okay. all right, the Epistle to Romans, the Epistle to Romans. Okay. Um, I talked to you about Luther. Oh, God. <coughs> I talked to you about Luther, and Luther is probably, as Protestants, the primary interpreter of Romans. How we understand Romans. Okay. Um, earlier in the class, I talked to you about, I talked to you about the new perspective. And um, I'll just share with you briefly while we go over uh, uh, Luther. Point, uh, I'm not going to repeat every, everything here, so just write it down if you want, okay? But what did Luther do? What did Luther do? Luther was a paranoid priest, okay? He was a paranoid priest because during the time, um, who had the overall ruling interpretation of God during his time? The Catholic Church, okay? And the way that the Catholic Church developed God and how we understand God is that he was a really ticked off God, okay? He was a very angry God, and he was angry at his creation, especially human beings. And everything that you did wrong, for Luther, everything that you did wrong, it's justifiable for God to just destroy you, okay? That's how he understood it, right? And because of his paranoia, some of his friends asked him to go to Wittenberg as a monk to learn Greek, okay? And he starts learning Greek, and he starts learning Greek, and that kind of revolutionized his view of God, his view of God, especially a phrase, which I'll get into the next, into the next slide. But the whole idea is this. He leaves the Protestant Reformation because of because of his new understanding of the Bible and his new understanding of God, um, because the Catholic Church at the time was so far away from the teachings of the Bible, okay? And so this led to the Protestant Reformation, all right? Um, the, way that, the way that Martin Luther, and don't worry about all this information, it's recorded, so don't have to write it down. Don't feel intimidated that you have to write it down right now. I'm just, just telling you kind of background. Um, so his understanding, his understanding of Romans, it has to deal with the individual, okay? The individual and his or her salvation has to do with that, okay? And that this individual believer has to fight against a works for salvation religion. Okay, because he feels his interpretation of Romans was during the time of Paul. The Jewish people, the Jewish people um, believed in a works for salvation religion, meaning that in order for me to get saved, in order for me to get saved, I have to do A, B, and C. Okay? And one particular uh, practice was circumcision. All right? So that's how he interpreted Romans. That's how he interpreted Romans. All right. Then two, three, four, five, six hundred years later, because it's fifteen something that he did the Protestant Reformation. So five hundred years later, scholars, New Testament scholars, took a moment to step back and ask the question: Was Luther right? Was Luther right? And a lot of people believe that his interpretation, especially on Romans, was biased was biased, okay? Especially because he equated the Jewish religion during the time of Paul with the Catholic religion of the 16th century, okay? Also, he was a notorious anti-Semite, okay? He hated the Jews, all right? And there's books upon books that he wrote about how he hated the Jews, but we'll not get into that. So there's all these different biases, all these different biases, okay? And so there was a group of New Testament scholars. I mean, they didn't, they didn't collaborate with each other, per se, but there was a group of New Testament scholars that stepped up and said, what if we actually interpret Romans based on first century research, based on a first century Jewish perspective, okay? This is known as new perspective of Paul, the new perspective of Paul, okay? If you read your commentary in um, the Romans commentary, it gives you a brief introduction. Um, it doesn't do it justice personally, but it gives you a good enough introduction for this class, okay? But this is the new perspective of Paul. The whole idea of the new perspective of Paul 
is to understand Paul with a first century Jewish mindset, not a 16th century German mindset. Okay? So that's what's happening here. Now, a lot of scholars then who support the new perspective, it's like gang mentality, biblical studies. Once you're in it, you're like, you're, you're, you're for life, you know, for vida, right? You know, and so forth. So it's just like, so, so a lot of people who are part of the new perspective, they just don't want to listen to Luther anymore. I disagree. I think there's a lot of things that Luther says that are actually legitimate, okay? So we're not going to take the, the baby with the bathwater, okay? We want to have this kind of, kind of needy, uh, medium place. We want to be in balance with the new perspective as well as Martin Luther's uh, understanding. On the other side, a lot of conservatives, a lot of conservative evangelical teachers support Luther. They think that Luther did it right, okay? And then they're unwilling to listen to the new perspective. I don't think that's a good idea either. I think there's a lot of great ideas that are coming from the new perspective. And as a matter of fact, I'm going to bring them up. I'm going to bring them up here and there. Um, often than not, I probably won't mention that there's a new perspective or not. So if you are ever curious, just feel free to ask and say, hey, professor, is this something that um, that was influenced by you by the new perspective or was it something from Luther? And I'll, I'll gladly tell you. OK, so that's the reason why I bring this up. That's the reason why I bring this brief introduction up is to let you know that I'm going to apply traditional interpretation, meaning something from Luther, as well as new perspective tradition into it as well. And we're going to get a mixture of it. And in my opinion, once we get a mixture of it, it's so much more fascinating and so much uh, so much richer um, of an interpretation when we get into Romans. Okay? Any questions about that? No. Great. No, is All right, cool. So then, why don't we begin? Let's continue on with Luther. Then I can go to the next slide, everybody. Okay, cool. Oh, by the way, you ever notice the date of when he put on the 95 theses? October 30th. Yeah, exactly. So if you don't want to celebrate Halloween, <laughs> celebrate the Protestant Reformation. Yes. <laughs> Which I hear, don't get me wrong, and I'm not supporting it, but in Germany, you have pretzels and beer celebrating the Protestant Reformation. Hallelujah! <laughs> okay, so what kind of compelled what kind of compelled his moment his this moment? It's his interpretation of Roman. Okay, that was the key to Luther's Protestant impact. All right, and it comes from Romans 1, 16 and seventeen. It's a phrase: the righteousness of God, the righteousness of God. Okay, and um, that's a very vague statement. That is a very vague statement. What does it mean when Paul says the righteousness of God. There's many ways that you can translate this. Many ways you can translate this, okay? It can be basically the character of righteousness is described about God. So it's like righteous God. That's one way of describing it. Or it could be ownership, you know, God's righteousness and so forth, right? Or it could be source, the righteousness from God. You know what I'm saying? So there's all these different ways to understand this four-word phrase. And no one knew this prior, or Martin Luther didn't know this prior to understanding Greek. Okay? So what was the popular understanding? It was, it was an explanation of God's character. The righteousness of God, or righteous God. Okay? And from that, prior to learning Greek, from that, this caused his paranoia. If God is righteous, as a human being, I'm unrighteous. And he has every right to decimate me, kill me, throw me, to throw me into hell, burn me alive. He has every right to do that. But then he learns Greek, and he realized there's something more to this phrase, okay? Instead of just conveying his character, it could also be conveying source, source. So for him, Martin Luther believed that the better way of translating 1, 16, and 17 is not righteous God, but the righteousness from God. Righteousness from God. 
What does that mean? Imagine a pitcher of water. And God owns that pitcher of water. And he looks at you as creation, as a thirsty individual. He pours that righteousness from his pitcher and gives it to you. That's how he pictured it. That God, this characteristic of God, whatever this was that was called righteousness, reserved once for God himself and only God himself, he's sharing it to his creation. And he then defines it and he calls it justification by faith. The only reason why we become righteous is because we simply believe in Jesus Christ. The righteous or the unrighteous becomes righteous. Righteousness from God. Okay? Revolutionary. This triggers everything for Luther. Triggers everything for Luther. It shows that the Catholic Church was wrong. It shows that there needs to be some change. It shows that we need to go back to the Holy Scriptures to understand who God really is. Okay? Question. <clears throat> Do we understand the differences? Yeah. I am recording. Okay, so prior for prior to Martin Luther learning Greek, the popular understanding that it was conveying God's character, that God was a righteous God, right? And that righteousness, another way of explaining his righteousness is his wrath, <laughs> and his, the wrath of God, the judgment, the torment of God, that he has every right to just say, you all are going to hell, and I don't care. You know what I'm saying? So that's what compelled... Martin Luther to be so paranoid, you know what I'm saying? If he did anything wrong, then he deserves help, right? But when he learned Greek, he says, oh, there's another way of translating it. It could be the righteousness from God, meaning that he gives the righteousness, or, and it continues on explaining his, his understanding, but basically he, God gives his righteousness to people and that we are justified by faith. Okay? Cool? So... That's nothing bad. I like what Luther did here. So we shouldn't throw that out, you know, and we should just preserve that and just see now with the new perspective how we can understand this better. All right. So that's Luther and his Romans. Let's talk about now the audience of the letter. It is the Christians in Rome. <coughs> the Christians in Rome. What was Rome during uh, Paul's time? It was the capital of the entire Roman Empire the capital of the entire Roman Empire. It was a city-state. It was a city-state, meaning that not only was it a city, but it acted a lot like a country, okay? So it was a city-state. <clears throat> During this time, there was a large Jewish population, approximately 40,000 to 50,000 Jews. Forty thousand, fifty thousand Jews, and within that forty to fifty thousand was a growing sect of Christians. Okay. Can I continue on? All right. Let's talk about the date and place of Romans. All right. No, not yet. Okay, cool. The date and place of Romans. When did Paul write Romans? It's an avid, that's a good question. Not avid, I mean. But it's a good question. We believe as conservative evangelicals, 57 AD. 57 AD, after the third missionary journey. I don't think there's any conflict or debate about that. Um, on both sides of the table, whether you're a liberal scholar or a conservative scholar, um, everyone believes that this Jewish Christian by the name of Paul wrote this letter. Okay? No doubt about it. No doubt about it. Okay? Galatians is another letter where everyone agrees that Paul wrote it. Um, there's certain letters that... Some disagree, but these two for sure, for the sake of this class, everyone on the table or everyone sitting around the table believes that Paul wrote these letters. Okay? 
No, we don't have a prison epistle class. It's only in New, New Testament history and literature that we introduce them. But those are the particular ones I believe that Paul didn't write. Right. Okay, so 57 AD, after the third missionary journey, all right? Now, the question is where? That's debatable. That's debatable. Um, but uh, for the sake of just this presentation, I'm just going to let you know. Believe that it's Sancria, the port of Corinth. Sancria, the port of Corinth. And during this time, why was he there? He's heading back to Jerusalem. And why is he heading back to Jerusalem? Well, I'll let you know. He gives offering money to help the Jerusalem church based on, and this is based on what we know from Romans 15, 25 through 26. Okay? So <clears throat> extra extrapolating the information from Romans 15, 25 through 26, we believe that he's at the port of Sancria writing this letter going back to Jerusalem. Okay, now if we, um, if we uh, combine this with the information of the book of Acts, uh, this is the time when he's in Jerusalem where he gets caught. He gets caught bringing Gentiles into the inner court or something like that. And it leads, it leads to this giant riot in Jerusalem. This is when he gets imprisoned. This is where he gets in prison, and he has to go all the way to um, go all the way to Rome in his imprisonment. Okay, um, it seemed like it was forced in the Book of Acts. It seemed like he was forced to go to Rome um, in his imprisonment. But it seems like reading the Book of Romans prior to any of this Jerusalem riot business happening, it seemed like he already had a desire to go to Rome. Okay, so. So it's interesting. It's interesting how God works here. You know what I'm saying? There's the desire that you have, and then God says, okay, for my will and for the sake of my will, I'll allow it to happen, but not the way that you expect it. You know what I'm saying? So it's just like you wonder, like, when Paul goes to Jerusalem, finishes what he needs to finish there, he was just going to find money to go to Rome, right, just like any regular person. God says, no, that's something else. I'm going to do something different. I'm actually going to throw you into prison. That's how you get to, get to Rome, you know? So it's interesting. It's interesting how God works here. So. All right, may I continue on? Okay. So the next question that I ask is, who were Paul's Romans? We're not too sure who Paul's Romans were, okay? It's based on limited and narrow amount of information. Based on the biblical understanding, based on the biblical understanding, okay, when, when I mean biblical inside <laughs> Romans, okay, we have chapter 1, 7 through, th thir uh, chapter one, seven through 13, and chapter 16, 1 through 16, okay? I'm not going to give you all the reasons right now. I'm just going to give you the source, the source information, okay? We also know from outside of Romans, Acts 2, chapter 2, 1 through 12, and chapter 18, verse 2. All right? So in the biblical account, in the biblical witness, those are the three places that we can get a picture or a glimpse of who Paul's Romans were. Okay? <clears throat> but then there's also the historical account. And what occurred in 49 AD under the rule of Emperor Claudius? Under the rule of Emperor Claudius. And I'll give you more details about this one because a lot of people are unfamiliar with what happened. During this time under the rule of Emperor Claudius, 49 AD, okay? So how many years was that before he wrote Romans 57 AD? So that you're looking at, what, eight years? Okay, so eight years prior to writing the letter of Romans, okay? The Emperor Claudius expels all the Jews out of Rome. Okay? The Emperor Claudius expels all the Jews out of Rome. All right? In 49 AD. Okay? So that's like 40 to 50,000 people. All right? 40 to 50,000 people totally out of Rome. He expels them. There's a reason for it, according to church historians. 
It's because the Jewish community was in a violent, rioting uproar over a dispute by the name of this gentleman, Crestos. Crestos. Okay? So, what am I saying? They had this horrific, violent debate over this guy named Crestos. Okay? A lot of church historians during that time, or after, a little bit after, believed that it was a Latinization of the Greek Christos. Christos. Okay? So, the whole idea is this. A lot of church historians thought that the rioting happened and compelled Emperor Claudius to expel all the Jews out of Rome. The rioting happened because of Christ. Their dispute over Christ. Okay? Why am I bringing that up? Christ was already in Rome before any apostle ever thought of it. <laughs> okay? The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ was already there. Was already there. The question is, how did it get there? How did it get there? And I'll explain my conclusions in the next slide. Questions? Now, yes, Desi. So you say Christos is Christos? Yes, exactly. It's a it's a Latin misspelling of the word of the Greek word Christos. Okay. May I continue on? Thank yes. you, Shirley. All right. So, who were Paul's Romans? Who were Paul's Romans? Don't. Just ignore that point right now. Just ignore that point right now. Who are Paul's Romans? All right? Point number one. Those who Paul did not disciple, but knew some. Okay? So he had kind of an acquaintance with some of the Roman believers in the Roman church. But he did not disciple any of them. Okay? That's what I'm trying to say in this statement. <coughs> He knew or he had an acquaintance with some of the believers in Rome, okay? But he did not disciple anyone from Rome, okay? That's what's going on here. So the next point I'm going to bring up is before is uh, after I say this is, um, is this. Um, how did Christ go to Rome? How did he? How did Christ go to Rome? How did the gospel message go to Rome before Paul, before Peter, before any of the apostles? How did it happen? How did it happen? Okay, and it's based on Acts. It's based on Acts, in my opinion. Acts two specifically. It is my opinion that it started by Pentecost. Pentecost, because when the Pentecost moment happened. There was people who said, what are we listening to when they're speaking in tongues, right? We're listening to every language, and everyone understands from A to Z. And some of the people there were from Rome. Yeah. Were from Rome, okay? Some of the people there were from Rome. Remember, remember, the Jewish festival, the high festival, like Pesach, Passover, Sukkot, uh, weeks, Tabernacles, what is the booth one? I always forget. Anyways, all those great major Jewish holidays were pilgrimage holidays. Mm. Meaning that the Jews all over the world needed to go back to Jerusalem to celebrate those holidays. If they can. If they can. Okay? So apparently, these Roman Jews um, were traveling all the way from Rome to to Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost or for Sukkot. Okay, the festival of weeks, right? And then they hear this great moment of speaking in tongues. They hear Peter preaching. They get baptized with the Holy Spirit. They don't stay in Jerusalem. They bring that back to Rome. Okay, so this is my belief. It is my opinion that the reason why the gospel of Jesus Christ was in Rome before Paul or Peter or anyone is because it was started by Pentecost. Makes sense. Thank you. That being said, there was an early Christian presence as early as the 40s AD. As early as the 40s AD. Okay? 
as early as the 40s AD, there was a small Christian movement within Rome. Okay? Then what happened in 49 AD? This dispute over Christos happened, and all the Jews get expelled. Right? So it's still, there was this church movement there. Okay? Um, it is believed, <laughs> it is believed, it is believed that when all the Jews left Rome, who remained? The Gentile Christians. The Gentiles who got converted within Rome. They stayed. They stayed. Okay? So, even though the Jews left, there was still a Christian community within the midst of Rome. It was led by the Gentile Christians. Okay? Now, the Jews come back. And I forgot what date the Jews come back. Okay? But they come back before Paul writes everything. All right? So, the next thing I should have pointed out is actually the last point. I want you guys to know the Roman church is a multi-ethnic church. It's a multi-ethnic church. There's a mixture of Jews, Jewish Christians, as well as Gentile Christians within the church. Okay? Now, that being said, it's just like the issues that happened in, in Galatia. In Galatia. Where the idea here is... Because of the demand for distinctions, there's conflict. There's conflict. One theory was about authority. Was about authority. Okay? So when the Jews left, when the Jews left, who are the leaders? The Gentile Christians. They had to pick leaders, right? And they became pastors, they became prophets, they became teachers and so forth, right? Awesome. Praise God. The Jews come back. Oh. I see what the Jews doing. come back and it's like, hey, welcome back, you guys. It's like, thank you. Now we can have Pastor Solomon help out with everything. It's like, wait, 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 wait. Pastor Bob is our pastor now. <laughs> pastor Solomon, he's gone. What about Pastor Bob? You know, Bob is a good Gentile name, right? And it's like, what about Pastor Bob, right? You no, know, it's like Pastor Solomon, though, he taught us everything. He should bring, he should become our pastor now. It's like, but what about Pastor Bob? What do we do with him? You know, he's in full-fledged ministry now. We can't, we can't just walk. We can't just kick him out. So there's disputes there. There's disputes there. Wow. Then there's also disputes about eating carnitas tacos on yeah. Sabbath day or gefilte fish, right? Yeah. So all these things are occurring within Rome, just like in Galatia. Just like in Galatia. Why? Because we as human beings demand unwanted distinctions. Wow. Makes us special, makes us different, and so forth, right? It's, a, it's the same story over and over again, okay? So Paul, in his own way, not to shake the boat too much, why? Because he doesn't know a whole lot of these folks, needs to gently teach them that demanding distinctions is not right, okay? So you'll notice his language, his verbiage in Galatians is not as... It's not as potent, and it's not as visceral, and it's not as violent as it is in Romans. Romans, he's gentler. He's more political. He's kinder, and so forth. Okay, But Galatians, he just tells it like it, like it is. Why? Because it's his church. Yeah. It's his baby. You know, He's talking to a friend here. So you get my point, right? Yeah. So finally, one last point is this. It wasn't a big mega church. But a collection of churches, okay? Um, but a collection of churches. There we go. <laughs> Very good. Okay. So I want us to understand there wasn't this huge mass mega church called the Church of Rome or the Gateway of Rome or Revive Rome. It wasn't this giant mega church. It wasn't three crosses Rome. It was a collection of small churches that were going. Okay. Resurgence Rome, uh, the Covenant Rome. No. Conversion of the Church. Oh, First Baptist Seminary. Right. International House of Prayer, Rome. You know, it's like it wasn't this giant. <laughs> this giant. This is how I started. So there was no issue. And it's recorded. Exactly. Oh dear. Oh dear. You will never be able to live that long. No, I can't. It's permanent now. Yeah. <laughs> So, uh, chances listening to recording. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. 
So I got two more slides and I'll give you guys a break, okay? So may I continue on? Yeah. All right. So the next question and the final question is this. Why does Paul write Romans? Why does Paul write Romans? We don't have a clear answer within the text. This is just a conclusion based from uh, that scholars have uh, made from the text, okay? And this is theory one. It's known as the resume theory. Resume theory, okay? According to Romans 15, 23 through 33, Paul wishes to go to Spain. He wants to go to Spain, okay? Now, there's a lot of reasons why he doesn't mention why he goes to Spain, except for this, that he can preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to Spain. Okay? Why does he want to go to Spain? Why does he want to go to Spain? Because in this moment of history, Spain was the edge of the earth. So if he continues from Jerusalem all the way to Spain, he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to the entire perceived world at the time. Oh, wow. Hey, that's so good. Right? And that's what it says in the... To preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, right? Yeah. That's exactly his commission. That is his job. So it's a lot of people believe that the reason why he wants to go to Spain is to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth. Okay, that's uh, yeah. All right. Now, where is his where is his missionary location during this time? It's in Syria, Antioch. It's Syria, Antioch. It's still in the Middle East. It's still in the Middle East, so it's like southeast of uh, Rome, all right? So so when he brings up all this information in the Roman letter, he's trying to convince Rome that it would be a better location in the capital of the world for his missionary headquarters to go to Spain. You know what I'm saying? So instead of traveling from Spain all the way to Syria and Antioch, it will be much easier for him, probably much cheaper for him, to go from Spain to Rome. You see what I'm getting at here? So the resume theory is this. He's basically asking Rome to partner with him in his missionary endeavors to go to Spain. That's the resume theory. Yeah, the resume theory is that he's wishing... Rome to partner with him in his missionary endeavors to go to Spain. Do you have baby words going? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he wishing Rome to partner with him to go to Spain, uh, to oh. preach the gospel to go to Spain. Um, so baby words? Simplify. <laughs> he wants Rome's help to preach the gospel to Spain. It's a fundraising. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. And then he also, but he also, it's like kind of like a resume. Like, it's like basically when a church needs a pastor and it's like, oh, we'll just go on Craigslist to find the pastor. No, you don't yeah. do that. You go, you go, you go, and um, you go through, you go through a strict interview process, right? And the letter to Romans was his resume, if you will. It shares his theology. What he believes about God and Jesus Christ and so forth. It shares how we should deal with one another as Christians. It's it's basically his 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 package deal, you know. This is what I believe, you know. And so um, this is kind of like the final draft of Galatians, if you will. Okay. <coughs> so that's oh, so that's the resume theory. I'm just gonna tell you this. Personally, you don't have to agree with me, but personally, I believe in this theory. This is my theory. This I didn't develop it or invent it, but I support this theory. Okay? Because the other theory is just stupid. It's just simply a letter. Okay? It's just simply a letter that Paul writes to exhort, instruct, and rebuke. That's it. My here's the thing. It's basically you ever have a Christian who just like steps beyond their boundaries and makes fun and criticize and so forth, um, and churches that, it's like, why are you even here? Shut up. You know what I'm saying? If, if we believe that Paul is just writing a letter to the Roman church, that's exactly what he's doing. You know what I'm saying? It's just like this self, this self-righteous, haughty, pretentious Christian that say, hey, 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 I looked at your church, and there's got to be some things that we need to work on here. 
I don't care. Who the heck are you? You know? So, so yeah. So, I'm not a big fan of the simply a letter theory. Cool? Where you're not a big fan? I'm not a big fan. So, I, I support the resume theory. Um, um, I invested in it. So. Okay. Final thing. And then, I'm not going to explain it. This is just the outline, my outline of Romans. Okay. Very simple. Super easy. Just three sections. Okay. Um. And that all being said, you guys can take a break now, come back here at 9, 10, and then we'll get into Romans 1 as much as we can, okay? So. I'm starting to record right now, and I am not going to show my screen anymore. Romans! So, no, stop, stop, stop. Okay, cool. All right, now, actually, you know what? Hey, Brad. How do I want to do this? How do I want to do this? Oh, I know how you want to do this. I know how I want to do this. Give me one second. No. All right. All right. So we're going to do slideshow. Your second song. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. I will show that screen because that screen looks good oh, yeah. so let's begin let's go into romans one everybody romans one it is a it is a monopoly i agree with you Dude, so oh yeah someone found my bible please return it Okay. Romans 1. Romans 1, 1 through 6. 1 through 6. Romans 1, 1 through 6. I'll read it in my new Bible. All right, excellent. So, Shaylin, give us a moment so that everyone can get there. Again, one more time. Romans 1, 1 through 6. No. What? Is that Romans after one, one through six, okay? And if someone could be a peach, get your finger in Galatians one. Right? Someone could just be a peach. I know what you're doing. All right. Romans one, one through six. Shailen, go ahead. All right. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God which he promised before him through his prophets of the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Excellent. Thank you, Shailene. Okay, now, this is a Greco-Roman letter. This is a Greco-Roman letter. I mentioned this a long time ago about how Greco-Roman letters are written, okay? And this part is the opening formula, the opening formula. And you need three components to the opening formula. You need a the description of the addressee, Okay, no, excuse me, a description of the sender first, then a description of the addressee second, and then a section of Thanksgiving. That's the opening formula. Okay, verse chapter one, verses one through six is simply the sender section. Chapter one, verses one through six is simply the sender section. Now, the, the peach who has his, his or her finger in Galatian, go back into Galatian. How many verses is devoted to just the sender in Galatians? Just the sender? Just the sender part. One, one or two. Three. Yeah, just one or two. Paul here is devoting six verses just for the sender part. Okay? And in, compared to Galatians, which is just about a couple of verses. What would that convey? Knowing what we know about the background information. Carlos. I think two things. Okay. I think one that, um, like you mentioned, he's, the people in Galatia know him. Right. And 
Okay. Okay. So he's he's trying to from the very get go let them know what. His resume, almost a resume theory. Very good. And so this is one of the reasons why I support the resume theory. It's yeah. just this real odd, this really odd moment that he uses six verses just to address himself. You know, and and but he's not really addressing himself. He's addressing what the gospel. So from the very get go, he lets them know what his gospel is all about. Okay, and that's what I want to bring up here. Even though it is the sender portion. This here is Romans micro gospel, okay? So specifically, Romans 1, 2 through 4 is what I call the micro gospel. Okay? And what is the micro gospel all about for the book of Romans? So whenever he talks about the gospel, we refer back to chapter 1, 2 through 4. Okay? It is the micro gospel, yes. Didn't Galatians have a micro gospel? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And it's gonna be different. It's gonna be different, but it's still the same. Different in the different in suggesting there's gonna be different details that you convey. Okay? Alright. So let's begin in verse two. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. Okay, regarding his son. Let's just stop right there. One more time. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son. Based on that statement alone, what can we say about this gospel? <laughs> what can we say about this gospel based on that statement alone? It was promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. It was foretold, very good. And then from that foretelling, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? His son, who Jesus. was born of his descendants. Not the details yet, not the content yet. He's a, it is what? It's fulfillment of, fulfillment of prophetic promises. Everything that the prophets promised in the Old Testament scriptures, everything that the prophets shared about this new reality, this new idea, this new coming, okay? The gospel is the fulfillment of it. The gospel is the fulfillment of prophetic promises, okay? The gospel is the fulfillment of prophetic promises. Now we're going to get into content regarding his son. Who, Jesus, as to his earthly life, was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Did Jesus have two different lives? From verses 3 and 4? Is he schizophrenic? He had an earthly life and a spiritual life? What's going on here? Or should I say, does he have two different essences? Wait, how do you get the hell here? From verse 4 and 5? 3 and 4. Oh. Regarding a son who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power? So did he have two essences? One as son of God and one the son of David? So, Two separate essences? No. Okay. So does that mean he had two separate essences? What is he talking about here? What is he talking about here? Three and four. Three and four. Just That's cute. That's cute. Because I'll tell you what. Two essences is heretical. Let's just say that. Okay. We do not believe that uh, Jesus had two different separate essences. Okay? So, what is he saying here? What is he saying here? Therefore, I'll say this. It's not that Paul is addressing Jesus' essences. Paul is addressing Jesus' stages of existence. Okay? One more time. One more time. Verse 3 and 4. 3 and 4. It's not about essence. Oh, 
but stages of existence. This has everything to do with something that is known as salvation history. I don't use, I haven't used that term a whole lot. What I used instead was Paul's apocalyptic thought. Apocalyptic thought. Okay? In Galatians, in Galatians, he addresses his apocalyptic thought constantly, hasn't he? Mm -hmm. Let's do some review. What is Paul's apocalyptic thought? What is Paul's apocalyptic thought? You need to understand this. Oh, the new age. Good. And what was previous? The old age. Mm. Very good. Present evil age. All right. So I'm going to draw history. I'm going to draw history for you guys. All history right now. Past, present, future. Ready? There it is. Boom. Wow. I don't remember. Okay? Now, I remembered that, okay. but I don't remember it now. Okay. Let's then review. I think this is good to review. Okay. What Paul believes, what Paul believes, and it's addressed in Romans 3, uh, 2 through 4, Christ's death inaugurated the new age. That's transformation. That's transformation. Amen. Christ's death inaugurated the new age. New age righteousness. Exactly. It is characterized by righteousness. Amen. Let them know. Righteousness, okay? The old age previous to that, which in this case I'm calling the old age now. It's the present evil age in Galatians. This is the old age now. The old age was characterized as what? Sin, death, anything opposite from God. Exactly. Chaos. Okay? Sin, death, chaos. All that, right? Good. Uh, how do we still know? Oh, I'll, I'll get that. I'll get to that later. Never mind. The old age. All right. What Paul is saying in verse 3 and 4 is not his essence, but stages of existence. Stages of existence. Meaning this. Who was Jesus in the old age? Good. Specifically, the what is described? Of, the son of David. Son of David. Yeah, son of David. So not is not only is he human, not only is Jesus human in the old age, but Jesus is also son of David. Regal. regal. He's also regal. What is regal? He has authority. Okay. He has authority. He's king-like in this authority. in this uh, old age. Okay, Jesus is the son of David. Um. He's human. He's human. Um, and then when the cross occurs, when the cross occurs, it reveals his full identity, which is what? Son of Who God. is Jesus in the new age? Son of son God. Of God. How does he become the son of God? Uh, what power? Declare what the power of the Resurrection. From the dead, and who provided that power to resurrect? God. The Holy Spirit. Who said it? Very good. He's empowered. <laughs> he's empowered by the <laughs> Son of God, empowered by HS. HS. Oh God. By the Holy Spirit. He is the Son of God, empowered by the Holy Spirit. How did he become the Son of God? By his resurrection from the dead. He's no, he has no, there's no, sin, death, chaos does not control him, right? Um, and then appointed, do, 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 do. I think that's it right now. So, cool. Okay, so one more time. It's not talking about his essence. It's not talking about his essence. He has, he has a shared essence, 100% man, 100% divine, right? It's talking about stages of existence. So we knew him in the old age as the son of David. We now know him as the son of God in the new. By the Holy okay. Spirit. All right, exactly. By the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Cool. Um, <coughs> the transition of existence is the inauguration of the new age. Okay. All right. So what does this mean? Who is the Lord of the new age? Very good. <coughs> and this pen smells. Snow? Snow. Okay. 
So the Lord of the old age was our disobedience, sin, death, chaos. Jesus is the Lord of the new. Okay? Questions? Yeah. Okay. Um, let's continue on then in verse 5. Through him we received grace and apostleship to call the, all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. So based on his lordship, who is the benefactor of Jesus' lordship? Us. No, us. Us. It's not just simply the Gentiles, it's the Gentiles and the Jews, but us. We are the benefic benefactors of Christ's lordship. Not just Jesus. Not just Jesus, but anyone who believes in Jesus, we are benefactors of his lordship. Okay? What are the two tangible examples of what of the of the benefits that we get or receive from Christ's lordship? What are the benefits that we get from his lordship? Grace. According to yes, very good. Grace. So we are so this is verse five. We are benefactors. And there's two things that we get is one grace and apostleship. <laughs> apostleship. That being said, that being said, each and every believer is somewhat of an apostle. Keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. You might work within the role of the apostle, as Ephesians says in the fivefold ministry. You might have that title. You might have that position. But as a Christian, all of us here have some kind of moving as an apostle. Why? Because once we believe in Jesus Christ as Lord, we receive grace and apostleship. We see grace and apostleship. Mm -hmm. Sir. Just like how we all have some form of Exactly. Exactly. We all, in one way or shape or another, exercise all the gifts. Okay? All right. Cool. Through him we receive grace and apostleship. Those are the two. Those are the two benefits. But what is the purpose of the apostleship and the grace? Bring about the obedience of faith. Through two All Gentiles, Gentiles, right. So in this case, in our circumstance, in our circumstance, we're the Gentiles. Gentiles were, <laughs> especially in the Jewish mindset, Gentiles were considered outsiders, outcasts, and so forth. Okay? So how will we use it as the church today? We go to the outcasts. We go to the sinners and so forth. We go to the prisoners. We go to everyone and anyone who is willing to listen to this message. That is our purpose. That is our purpose. Okay? So, another thing that we need to say here. When you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're not just simply a child getting fat from all the benefits. Yeah. When Jesus Christ calls you, or when, Je when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, not only do you have identity, but you also have responsibility. That's good. Mm -hmm. Okay? Yeah. All right? So, one more time, when Jesus Christ calls you, or when you accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, you not only have identity, a child of God, through grace, but you also have responsibility. You are also called. You are also called. And all of us, based on this micro-gospel, is unified to one call. What is that? To call the Gentiles, outsiders, sinners, whoever, what to the obedience that comes from faith for his name's sake. Um, all of us, all of us here are united to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is our calling. That is our calling. And if pastors tell you otherwise, all you need is just to accept him and say the lip sinner's prayer. Everything's going to be gravy. You're going to have that house on the hill. You're going to have that car. You're going to have that fine looking wife. All those things, all those things will be yours. That pastor is wrong. That pastor is wrong. I should call that hold on, hold on, hold on. I shouldn't say wrong. Just misguided. Misguided. Okay? So it's wrong. Misguided. Because it's nice to have a fun wife, right? Or husband, right? Yes, Cynthia. <laughs> um, under where it says new age righteousness, yes. it says Lord J L. That's a C. Just kidding. That's a C. 
So, okay, yeah. sorry about that. So, we received were the benefits, the benefits of grace and apostleship, to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith, for his name's sake. This is a tangent here. Um, we call Gentiles to what? We call Gentiles to do what? To, be, uh, to obey? obey. To obey that comes from where? Faith. Okay, excellent. So, faith... You want to know? You want to know when you have true faith? Yes. You're willing to obey. Mm. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's a, that's a, a lot of people, a lot of people think it's simply a cognitive thing. I don't know if Jesus is Lord. I don't know if he's God. I don't know if he's Christ. But if there's something within you that says, I want to serve, I want to help out. I want to do this. Even though you struggle with these things in your mind, but you act out in obedience, you have faith. You have faith. And there's nothing in this world, not even Satan himself, can take that away from you. Mm, come on. Anyone hands up? Jesus. Yeah, I was going to say, you could even do, like, say, like, he's not um, as, I want to say, I'm just going to say powerful because that's the word that's coming to me. Yeah. Um, as he is because you're not being obedient because you're scared that it's not going to come through. Because you can like low-key think that God won't come through okay. without actually saying it. Okay, very good. So the whole idea here is a what I'm trying to say, and I think you're saying the same thing, is this. A good, a good litmus test to see that you have faith is if you're obedient to God, right? If you don't have faith, sometimes you're not obedient to God, right? Or you choose not to be obedient. So I see what you're saying. So very good. This is just a tangent, but this is a huge tangent of yeah. what just Paul just said. And, and I just want to let you guys be encouraged. Some of you guys might be struggling with it right now. I still struggle with it. God, are you really God? Jesus, are you really God? This and that, this and that, you know? But if I choose to say, even though I struggle with those things, help me be obedient. Help me serve. Help yeah. me be kind. Help me be more loving. You have faith. You have faith. Okay? Carlos. Uh, I think the answer is, I was just going to ask, so what if you struggle to obey? If you struggle to obey, then there's something wrong with your faith. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with your faith. So that's the whole idea. Ooh, what about Paul's statement about him struggling to obey and do the thing? That he wants to do, that, yeah. that he does. At the end of it all, we'll see. But glory be to glory. God, there's a helper and so forth. So we'll get into that. So, yeah. Yes? Was Romans 7 written when he first got saved, essentially? No. Oh, okay. No. No, this is much later in Paul's life. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> all right, cool. Um, let's see, let's see. So through him, <laughs> verse 5, through him we receive grace and apostleship to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that come from faith for his name's sake. So what's the purpose? What's the purpose that we do the apostleship thing? To bring I'm upset I was the only one that was in Apostleship, the purpose of our apostleship is this. According to Paul, according to Paul, he says, for the, for the, the sake of Jesus' name, I equate that, so, so for his name's sake. I equate that for glorifying Jesus. Glorifying Jesus. Okay, so why do we preach the gospel? Why do we preach the gospel? <laughs> oh, God, that's time to get out of here. Wait, what? It sounded like you always said Quran, so we were like, what? <laughs> Quran, Quran, Quran. 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 Oh, oh. So we were like, what? Ah, the period. Oh, the period. Oh, the period. Oh, the period. I think I'm in the wrong Bible college. Okay, it's time to let you guys know. I am an imam. Anyway. Uh, anyways, and you have to go to Mecca at, what, at least once. You know, uh, 
But uh, it's <laughs> being recorded. I know, right? <laughs> oh gosh. Anyway, <laughs> we don't want to get here. So the apostleship. Why do we go out to proclaim to the Gentiles the obedience that comes from faith? Why? For His name's sake. Yeah. For His name's sake. What does it mean to glorify Jesus? Here's how you need to understand glorify. They come from the Hebrew understanding. Glory in Greek is doxa, D-O-X-A, D-O-X-A, okay? It comes from the Hebrew word chavod, chavod, C-H-A-V-O-D, C-H-A-V-O-D, chavod, to glorify God, chavod, chavod. Don't, if you take all the religious stuff out of that word, pay attention, you guys. If you take all the religious stuff out of that word, chavod simply means heavy. 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 Okay? So when we are talking about for the purpose of glorifying Jesus, what we're saying based on the Hebrew understanding is this. We're making Jesus' name heavy. We're making Jesus' name heavy or weighty. How do I understand that? We make Jesus' name tangible. Tangible. So tangible that it looks real, just like I'm seeing Burnett, I'm seeing Deshaun, I'm seeing Junior. It's that real. Okay? Because I tell you what, can we see physically right now Jesus Christ? No. He's up in heaven inaugurating his kingdom and building those rooms, right? We don't physically see Jesus. What it means to glorify Jesus is to make him so real in this age that people are convinced that he's sitting on the throne in heaven. To make him real. To make him real. That's why we are apostles. The purpose of us preaching to this world is to make Jesus real. Because there's a lot of people in this world who don't think so. To make Jesus real. That's what it means to glorify Jesus. To make Jesus tangible. Yeah. To make Jesus tangible. Okay? So, glorifying Jesus means to make Jesus tangible. And you know how he uses it? You know how he does it? Through you guys. Through us. Through us. When a woman or when a young girl is crying because she's pregnant, doesn't want to be pregnant, she's not sure what to do, and points the light, she comes to you crying on your shoulder, you become Jesus' shoulder at that moment. Yeah. When a person wants to try to, you know, wants to try to, uh, wants to try to, you know, um, bank rob or, or try to steal something from a liquor store, and you're behind them, and something in your heart says to talk to them about that something, and say, don't do it, you become Jesus at that moment. You guys make Jesus tangible. Yeah. You guys, okay? So just keep, keep, keep that in mind, that he calls you for that purpose. When, when, when people build their own kingdoms, when they want to build their own things and so forth and whatnot, all those things... It's, they're not thinking about making Jesus tangible. You see what I'm getting at? That's the difference. Okay? Cool? All right. And then finally, and finally in verse 6, And you also are among those Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Amen. Verse 7, To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be his holy people, grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to mention just one thing in verse 7. <laughs> To all in Rome who are loved by God and what? Called. Called to do what? Called to do what? Be saints. To be saints or to be his holy people. Remember I told you about distinctions? As his church, as his church, we are to be distinct. We are to be different. The problem is this, that within the church, you demand more distinctions. That's the problem with the circumciser group in Galatians. We had the church, but within the other, within the church, they said we need to make special Christians. 
And those special Christians need to be circumcised. That's the problem. So, one more time. As the church whole, as the entire church, we are distinct. We have to be distinct. We have to be unique. We have to be different. The problem is if we demand more distinctions within the church. That's the problem. That's the problem. To make better Christians than other Christians. You know what I'm saying? That's the problem. That's the problem. The church as a whole, one more time, the church as a whole is called to be distinct. It's called to be holy. Okay? But we don't need to make smaller distinctions other than that. Then the next question is, what does it mean to be holy? Going back to Galatians, it's faith expressed through love. Meaning this, my loyalty in Jesus Christ conveyed through selflessness. That's what it means to be holy. Okay? Questions about that? So one more time. We are, as the church as a whole, is call, are called to be saints. or called to be holy. We are called to be holy. We're called to be different. We're called to be distinct. The problem is when we go within the church to make more distinctions to cause division and disunity within the church. Okay? Now, are all Christians the same? No. We're all different. We're all different. And the problem is we demand, we think that we demand those differences in order to show that we're a better Christian. It should be the other way around. You should use your differences to encourage others to be more like Christ, to be more holy. You know what I'm saying? So, oh. All right? Any questions or comments? Golly, just six verses and I wasted this time. I shouldn't say this. Um, okay, so four points that I want to say about one through six, about the micro gospel, okay? Four points. Point number one. Jesus is empowered by the Holy Spirit. Here's the next point. I shouldn't say this. I'm not going to write it, but you have to understand the logic of this. If Jesus was empowered by the Holy Spirit, how much more so are we empowered by the Holy Spirit? Okay? So once we become, once we accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, we also get to share in that empowerment. Yes? Is this about... Verses 2 through 4, or is this about <laughs> verses 1 through 6? 2 through 4 specifically, but 1 through 6 as a whole. Okay? Point number 2. Jesus' death inaugurates... Inaugurate... What? Sorry. Inaugurates the new age. This is what I wanted to bring up here. Okay? Check this out. I want you guys to know this. If you guys don't know this, I need to tell you guys right now. We get to experience the new age. The new age already happened. The new age is here. The new age is here. Okay? When did it happen? On the cross. Now, some of you might be saying, just like a good Jewish person should, wait, 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 Professor Simon. Wait, 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 Professor Simon. How can you say that we're living in the new age right now? How can you possibly say that? When we're experiencing what? Death, chaos, sin, and destruction, right? Very good, very good. What Paul and the early Christians brought up is this. There's going to be a second coming. There will be a second coming, okay? There will be a second coming when the entire new age will be fully realized, okay? But in that time... What we're experiencing here is the is the age of in between. Right now, we are experiencing the age of in between. Do we fully experience the new age? No. Are we in the new age? Yes. We're not fully experiencing it because there's certain things of the old age still creeping in because we are of the age of in between. Okay. But you guys need to know this. We, all of us here, are in the new age. This entire world are, is in the new age. Why do I say that? 
Why do we need to understand that? Is because since we're in the new age, we can use the righteous power that is promised in the new age, which is the Holy Spirit. We can use the Holy Spirit right now. Or we can implement the Holy Spirit right now. Okay? We are partakers of the old and new right now because we are in this age. The age of in-between. Okay? It's already happened. Jesus inaugurated it. We're in it. But we haven't fully experienced it. But we are experiencing some of it. How are we experiencing some of it right now? Gifts of the Spirit. Gifts of the Spirit. That's exactly right. Speaking in tongues, healings, um, miracles, and so forth. How else are we experiencing it? The Holy Spirit. Right, being upon us, like being able to feel the Holy Spirit. Okay, discernment and so forth. Forgiveness is another thing. Forgiveness. Grace. Um, power over temptation. Grace. Exactly. 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 Those are things that we get to experience. Racial reconciliation. Gender reconciliation. Um, economic status reconciliation, those are all things of his grace. Yes. So how I understand it is that we're in the new age, but we haven't fully gotten rid of all of the old age. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Until Christ comes as judge, that's the thing. Christ, its second coming is him bringing God's wrath. And we'll see what God's wrath looks like, but it's, it's him as judge. Okay? But once that happens, we're in the land of in-between right now. Okay? So, Jesus acknowledged the new age. We also need to know that Jesus is the Lord of the new age. Okay? And the beautiful thing is this. Gentiles are welcome in the new age. Okay. Gentiles are welcomed in the new age. Questions? Okay, cool. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. The gospel is more than just Jesus forgave your sins. What does that mean? What does that mean? Okay? It means this. Before you were stuck in the old age, and the old age is going to disappear. And in Romans, the second half of Romans, we'll see how it's going to disappear. How it's going to get destroyed. Okay? In the second half of Romans. You'll be stuck in that. We were supposed to be stuck in that. Especially as Gentiles, we were supposed to be stuck in that. But then all of a sudden, this Galilean, 2,000 years ago, died. And that opened the door for Gentiles and Jewish people alike to have trust in him to get into this thing called the New Age. Okay? Cool? All right, that should be enough for you guys. Study hard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, may the Lord be with you guys. Love you, and I will see you guys on Friday. All right? Are you going to Marvin? I don't think so. <gasps> oh, yeah, I called you. Huh? Yeah. I don't think so. I'm coming. Um,